All right, so I want to welcome everyone back. This is going to be our screencast for chapter 53. And in 53, what we're going to do is we are going to look at the area of science called population ecology. Now, when you look at population ecology, this is simply the study of population size. And that particular population size is going to be identified by the letter N. And it's going to be in relation to the environment. And that environment is going to include various different types of influences. And if you notice on the screen, we have four different influences that we need to um, be aware of. The very first one is going to be something called density. And when you look at density in regards to population ecology, what we're looking at is simply the number of individuals in a given area of that environment. The second thing we need to look at is something called distribution. And distribution basically refers to um, where you're going to find that particular population and how it's going to be organized within that environment. Now, there's going to be three different um, types of distribution that you could look at in population ecology. The first one is called random, and if you look over here on the far right, this is going to represent um, the idea of a random distribution of the um, grass that you see in this particular picture, and it's going to be influenced by the absence of strong either attractions or repulsions within that environment, so that's going to give it that random type of characteristic. And the second is going to be a type of distribution of that particular population that's going to be more uniform. And if you look over here on the far left, this um, particular picture of these penguins that you see here is um, representing this type of distribution. And so this is going to be influenced by resource availability and the behavior of the organisms within that particular um, population. Then the third is going to be called clumped. And if you notice right here in this particular picture, we have a group of starfish that are clumped in one area. Now this clumping of these particular types of organisms is going to be influenced heavily by something called territoriality. Um, so basically the idea that they have a given sort of defined area that they tend to inhabit. And so then what they do is they try to defend that particular area from other organisms. Now a third type of influence that we need to think about when we look at um, population ecology is something called the age structure. And this is simply looking at how old those individuals are within that population. And the fourth one is going to be something called sex ratio. In other words, how many members of that population are male and how many members of that population are female. As we had said, um, this area of population ecology is going to deal with populations, and so we need to look at a definition for population. So a population is simply going to be a group of single species that are going to be living in the same generalized area. Now this population is going to be dictated or determined by four things. And the first one is going to be something called the birth rate within that population. The second is going to be the death rate. The third is going to be immigration, which is basically um, individuals that might move into that generalized area. And the fourth is going to be emigration. And so that's going to be the movement of individuals out of that area. Now, if you notice down here, we have a mathematical formula, and this formula is going to basically give us some information in regards to the growth rate for that particular population in that area. And so what we need to do before we talk about the equation is we need to sort of understand what each of these letters mean. And so when you look at this in here, this is going to be N sub zero, and this is going to indicate to us the initial population of that um, particular species that we happen to be looking at within that given area. But what we're really trying to look at is we're trying to look at um, sort of the change in that population over a period of time. And in this case, in order to find that change in the population, we have to look at those four things that we had just mentioned. So we have to look at the birth rate, we have to look at the death rate, we have to look at immigration, and we also have to look at emigration. So this is just an example. If you notice, um, this is again going to be the change in that initial population. And so here, for example, we have a birth rate of our fictitious population of three. Um, we had one of those individuals die, so this would be three minus one. And then when we look at the immigration and the emigration rate of that population, maybe we had one individual that moved in and we had two individuals that moved out. And so three minus one, of course, is going to be two. And then we're going to add that to a negative one. And so that's going to give us a change in our population of one. But what we're really trying to find is we're trying to find something called the intrinsic growth rate of that population. And so to find that, what you're going to do is you're going to take the change in N and divide it by that initial population size. And so the change in N that we had calculated up here, which was 1, we're going to take that and divide it by our initial population, which in this example was going to be 10. And when you take 1 divided by 10, you get basically 0.1 
or basically within this population we have a 10% growth rate based on the information that we have here. Now population growth can be identified in two different ways. The first one is going to be called logistic population growth and the second is going to be called exponential population growth. Now when you look at logistic population growth we're looking at the rate of increase that declines as we reach something called the carrying capacity of that population. And what this is going to do is it's going to cause our graph to take on sort of an S-shaped type of curve. And over here on the right in this graph you can see the red line that you see here sort of demonstrates that um, logistic type of growth or S-shaped curve. As we had said also that logistic population growth is going to basically be determined by that population's carrying capacity which is often identified by the capital letter K. And this is going to be the maximum population size that can be supported um, within that environment. Now this is going to be due to various limiting resources within that population. Now these resources can be identified in two different ways. The first one is going to be called a density dependent type of factor. And when you talk about density dependent factors for a population, we're talking about things such as the availability of food, maybe the availability of water. Um, we could be talking about things such as disease, and these are considered limiting resources. In other words, there's only so much that, that environment can handle and provide to that particular organism. But then we have those that are called density independent factors. And so these are going to be factors within the environment that might change that population in regards to numbers, but it's not going to be based on the density of the population. So a good example of this would be a forest fire. In other words, it really doesn't make any difference how many members we have within that population. Um, the forest fire, if it does occur, will still take out um, a good portion of that population. So in other words, it's not dependent on how many organisms within the population such as we would find with those density dependent factors. Now, as we had said, there's going to be a second different type of growth and this is going to be called an exponential population growth. And so this is basically when the population increases but it's under ideal conditions. Now the rate of reproduction basically is going to be at its maximum and so this is going to cause the graph to take on sort of a J-shaped curve and in most cases this is not going to be sustainable within that population. So again if you look up here in the upper right you're going to notice this blue line that you see right here is going to be our exponential growth curve. Now there is some math that we will um, look at when it comes down to calculating exponential growth and that's going to be seen down here at the bottom. So this is going to be the formula that we would use and so this is going to be our population um, during a period of time and this is going to be our initial population number. The E is going to be represented by a constant and that constant is going to be 2.71. Now this R that you can see right here is going to be our um, intrins intrinsic growth rate and then of course the T is going to represent time. And so as I had said, this NT that you see right here, which is what we're trying to calculate, is basically allowing us to sort of predict what the population might be in the future. Now when you take this information and you start looking at particular populations of organisms um, within certain environments, we can place them into two categories. We can consider them either K-selected populations, or we can call them R-selected populations. Now if a particular organism is what we would consider K-selected, they basically have a density dependent type of selection. In other words, it selects for traits that are sensitive to population density. And sometimes they'll refer to this sort of as a negative feedback type of thing. Now, characteristics of these types of um, organisms tend to be where they hit their carrying capacity and they just simply tend to stay there. Um, these particular organisms tend to have very few offspring and they do tend to give quite a bit of parental care to those offspring. But as we had said, they're going to be affected by those density dependent factors such as food, disease, maybe the availability of shelter, things such as that. Now over here on the right, it's really kind of difficult to see this, but this is going to be a graph of the um, populations of whooping cranes, which were considered critically endangered in the um, late 1930s. In fact, they got down, I believe, to um, a population of about 14 or 18 individuals. But because of um, our breeding programs that we've sort of um, implemented for these animals, there's been a gradual increase in their population. Well, these are considered a case-selected type of population. And it's simply because, again, they are very heavily influenced by density-dependent factors. But if you notice, over a period of time, and in this case, the graph goes to 2010, there's been a steady increase in those numbers. 
Now down here on the bottom, what you see is a good example of an R-selected type of um, population of organisms. And these are going to be the ones that are influenced by density independent selection. So this is going to select for life history traits that tend to maximize reproduction during certain parts of the um, organism's life cycle. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll consider this sort of a boom and bust type of cycle. Now this one again, I know the graph's kind of small, but this graph is representing this R-selected type of situation. And in this case, we have two different types of organisms. In fact, it's a predator-prey type of situation where the green line is going to represent the snowshoe here. And the sort of orange line that you see going up and down here is going to represent the Canadian lynx. And the graph itself starts around 1845, and over here on the far right it goes till about 1925. And so what scientists had noted was that when you look at the um, life cycle of the um, snowshoe here, it has sort of peaks and valleys. In other words, in this particular area it's going to boom, and in this particular area it's going to bust. And so their population rises really quickly over a few years, but then it basically crashes. And it does that in sort of a periodic type of way throughout many years. In other words, this is the way their population is regulated. It's an R-selected type of situation. But what you'll find is the Canadian lynx also tends to have sort of that boom and bust type of cycle because it's heavily dependent on the snowshoe here for food. So when you have individuals of the snowshoe here that are very high, in other words, the population numbers are high, you tend to have populations of Canadian lynx that are high as well. But when they crash, the um, population of the Canadian lynx also crashes as well. And so the birth rate and the death rate basically do not change the population of that particular um, um, organism over a long period of time. This is just the natural cycle of these individuals. Now when you talk about population ecology, you'll often come across a word called demography. And these are demographics, basically, which is simply the study of the vital statistics of a population and how they change over time. So what we're essentially looking at is the birth and death rates of those organisms within that population. And what we'll do is we'll create something called a life table. And this is going to be an age-specific summary of the survival pattern of a population by following a group and simply creating something called a survivorship curve for that organism. Now those curves can fall into three categories. The first one is called a type one survivorship curve. And a good example of this would be us. In other words, we have very low death rates during early and middle life. In other words, when we have lots of um, babies that are born, we have very few of them that die. But as you notice, as we age, of course, as we get into our, say, 70s, 80s, and 90s, then of course we start to die. And so in other words, an increase in death occurs among the older individuals within our population. In a type 2 type of um, survivorship curve, this is basically when the death rate is going to be constant over the organism's lifespan. And the ground squirrel that you see here tends to represent um, a really good example of a type 2 um, type of survivorship curve. Now type 3 is going to be where you have a very high death rate for the young. In other words, they might produce many, many offspring, but quite a few of those offspring die um, before they get to maturity. But then you'll notice that once they do get to maturity, they have a much slower death rate for the survivors that are left behind. Alright, so if you remember earlier we had talked about two different types of growth models. The first one being logistic, and the second was that exponential growth model. Now what's interesting about this growth model is it can actually help us to understand the capacity of a species to increase and the conditions that actually might encourage or facilitate this type of growth. Now there will actually be times where we actually have zero population growth. And really the only way that this can actually occur is when the birth rate within that population actually equals the death rate within that population. Now, population growth is going to be defined as the growth rate at a particular instant in time. And so if you notice over here on the right, what we have is a data table. And we're going to start off with a population of 10 at time 0. So our job is to sort of predict what the population will be in the future. So we can imagine that each of the numbers you see here could represent a year. So this would be 1 year, 2 years, 3 years, all the way down to 30 years. Now, we can use the equation you see over here on the left to help us make those um, predictions. 
Now, over here, again, we have a change in the population. That's what n represents. That's our initial population over that period of time. So again, that's what population growth is. So it's going to equal r, which was going to be the birth minus the death rates over the population size. Again, that initial population size. So that's going to be our intrinsic growth rate. And again, the n is representing our initial population. So say, for example, we have maybe five births for that population, but we have maybe two deaths for that population. We're going to take five minus two, which is going to be three, and we're going to divide that by n, which in this case over here, from the information that we have in our table, the initial population is going to be 10. So we take three divided by 10. So that's going to give us 0.3. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take this r value, which is what we've calculated, that's our intrinsic growth rate, and we're going to take that 0.3 and we're going to multiply it by our population, which in this case is going to be 10. And so that's going to give us a population growth for this particular time frame of 3. So we're going to take that 3 and we're going to add it to this 10. So that's going to give us 13 individuals in that population. We're predicting this for that first year. But then what we're going to do is we're going to do the same exact thing, again, still using this R value, and we're going to take 0.3 and we're going to multiply that by 13 this time. And that's going to give us a about 4. I think it's close to 3.9. So we're going to take that 4 and we're going to add it to 13. And so we predict that during year 2, we should have around 17 individuals in that population. And we'll do the same thing for year 3. Again, we simply take that 0.3 and we multiply it by, in this case, would be 17 and that's going to give us close to 5. I think it's 5.1. And so we're going to take that 5, we're going to add it to 17, and that's going to give us a population size, again, a predicted population size of 22. So what you can do with these numbers is you can actually graph them and look at the growth rate of that population. Now, the only problem with doing this math is that once you get into the numbers that you see down here, these numbers can be incredibly large. And so that's when a spreadsheet would come in really handy to make your calculations. So there is a second way that you can actually find out the same exact information that we were calculating over here on the far right. And it's simply by using a little bit of algebra. And so for those of you who are comfortable doing this, you're welcome to use the equation that you see down here towards the bottom. Um, you can plug in the same numbers. It's going to give you the same information. Um, but again, using those spreadsheets that I mentioned a little bit earlier, maybe using formulas within a spreadsheet is going to make your job a lot easier when it comes down to um, actually calculating those really large numbers that you're going to find as the period of time increases. All right, so that's going to finish up our screencast for Chapter 53. Again, we're just touching a little bit on population ecology. Um, as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide.